Hi everyone, my name is Dylan Gonzalez. I am a senior critic for GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. I'm here today to discuss some really great Blu-ray releases that I've had the pleasure of checking out from Classic Flicks. Classic Flicks is a label that I've only come to recently in the last year, but they've quickly become one of my favorite labels just for the sheer uh, breadth of classics they've been able to bring to my life. Um, they are the type of people who find kind of the hidden gems that you probably wouldn't get to see otherwise. Um, some of them in some really uh, poor deteriorating elements and then restoring them and letting us be able to see them for probably the only time we would be able to. So I am going to uh, discuss six of their releases. I'm going to go from one of their most recent releases um, back a little bit uh, further into their earliest releases. Um, and so I will start with the recently released uh, Little Rascal Volume 4. And I guess as a bonus, I will show off the first three volumes. Um, if you do not have these yet, uh, what are you doing? Because they are great. Um, these shorts are a lot of fun. Uh, what I really like about the uh, How Roach's Little Rascal shorts is um, these kids are able to kind of really embrace acting like kids and they weren't really coached to be kind of beyond their means. So a lot of the humor comes from them just as being uh, genuine kids and like being put in to these situations, but being kind of able to respond organically. And a lot of the, there's just a lot of like wholesome, cute energy radiating from these shorts that I really like. Um, it's a lot of silly humor. There's some not PC humor, um, which is to be expected from a material from the early 1930s. Um, but if you can get kind of past that, there's a lot of really, really funny moments within this. And uh, the fourth volume uh, encapsulates some 12 shorts from 1933 to 1935. Um, and during this time, the character of Scotty, who is a kind of a fan favorite, was introduced as a, uh, a partner in crime to uh, Spanky. So uh, the back of the case kind of uh, describes their dynamic as kind of Laurel and Hardy-esque, which I can kind of understand. I can I get that. They have a lot of uh, fun interactions with kind of the older kids in the gang. Um, and also, in addition to them, there's uh, some of the favorites such as uh, Stymie, Weezer, and Buckwheat. Uh, one of my favorite shorts um, on this release is this uh, short called Bedtime War bedtime worries um, in which uh, Spanky uh, is uh, it's a classic case of Spanky trying to uh, sleep in the bed alone and then of course uh, a robber is trying to get into his room and every time he tries to fend this robber off and tell an adult no one believes him um, so um, it's just kind of like I mean, it's scary if you think about it, but it's played comedically and um, it's uh, a really uh, funny short along with a lot of others. Um, like I said, there's some shorts that are kind of uncomfortable uh, PC wise and, um, but uh, like, you, like I said, you just kind of have to roll with it with some of these. There's enough really like just genuinely funny moments within this um, that you should just really take the time to watch this because, like I said, it has been meticulously restored. These mostly look pretty excellent. And um, the sound, yes, there's some kind of like faint hissing um, in the background uh, throughout most of these, but this was really early sound recording. So you kind of had to give it a little bit of slack. Um, if you are a Little Rascals fan or just like interested in kind of those really just funny short films from like the early 1930s. This is definitely, all of these should be added to your collection. And I know a fifth one, a fifth volume is coming out in April, which I'm really excited to continue my collection. Um, and then the next release that I wanted to highlight is Black Magic with Orson Welles, which comes from 1949. Um, this one actually comes from, is based off a novel from Alexander Dumas, um, who did uh, the Three Musketeers book. Um, this uh, is about a uh, magician um, whose name is Joseph Balsamo. Um, it starts off with kind of 
uh, Alexander Dumas being told this story by his grandfather, and then it kind of flashes back to uh, Joseph as a child, and he's like a gypsy child, and his parents get killed by um, uh, this evil uh, kind of ruler. And he is also about to be killed, but he is saved by uh, some gypsies, and he is uh, shown to grow up into Orson Welles. Um, and along his journey, he kind of wants uh, vengeance, um, but he gets, uh, he learns the process of mesmerism uh, from this uh, older gentleman who is using it for the good, like the greater good, um, but of course, Joseph, who goes on to call himself uh, the Cagliostro, um, he wants to get revenge for his parents. And the plot is kind of, uh, I don't want to like brush over it too much, but it involves, uh, it weaves in historical truths into this fictional tale um, of they, his, basically his plan is to replace the real uh, Marie Antoinette with a lookalike uh, played by Nancy Guild um, and kind of uh, weakened, weakened the political structure of France. Um, so it's a lot of uh, interesting uh, uses of like hypnotism and mesmerism to control people. Uh, I didn't, I'll be honest, I did not love this movie, but I did find it very interesting. Um, Orson Welles, even in his, like, lesser roles, like, lesser known roles, he always gives it his all. And I did mostly enjoy it. Um, I just had trouble kind of staying completely invested for a nearly an hour and 45 minutes. I think it could have been, like, a more enjoyable hour and a half movie. But overall, I think it's a, a pretty good movie. Uh, it's a good revenge tale, and you can also get kind of uh, some historical aspects woven in there as well. Um, the release itself is really great. Um, there are no special features, but the transfer itself looks really good. Um, and uh, yeah, if you are a fan of kind of historical fiction. I think you will enjoy this. If you're an Orson Welles fan, I think, like I said, even his lesser work is worth checking out. Um, and yeah, it's it's a good release. Classic Flicks did a good job with this. I would have probably never seen it otherwise, so I appreciate their release. Uh, this next movie I enjoyed quite a bit more, and that is Stand In from 1937 with Leslie Howard and Joan Blondell. Uh, Joan Blondell is a person who I am quickly becoming enamored with. Um, I really liked her in this movie, um, and I know I will be seeing her soon in The Gold Diggers of 1933, which Warner Archive is releasing very soon. Um, Leslie Howard, he plays kind of like a socially awkward uh, man who works for a bank and at this bank, it is decide like they own this movie studio, and there is a decision that maybe it would be more prosperous to just sell off this studio to kind of a rival studio and get it off their books. Whereas the Leslie Howard character, um, he's not so sure. And in order to prove who is right and what is the right financial uh, play to go towards, he goes, it's, this is kind of a convoluted plot, he goes to uh, Hollywood to take over this studio temporarily um, and kind of uh, see if it can be prosperous for the bank. And while he is there, um, he befriends the titular stand-in, uh, played by Joan Blondell, who is a woman who, who stands in for the star of one of the pictures um, whenever she like they're like setting lights up and stuff like that whenever they don't want the actual talent standing around on set and their dynamic uh, the dynamic of Leslie Howard and Joan Blondell is very charming um, and this is a really really good satire of Hollywood and kind of like the eccentricities and like larger than life uh, aspects of Hollywood um, there's just like uh, constantly people coming up to the Leslie Howard character and like pitching themselves to him and there's like 
tigers on leashes and stuff and it's just ridiculous but basically uh, there's also a small role for Humphrey Bogart uh, in one of his earliest roles um, and basically uh, there is a uh, faction of people who are trying to intentionally tank uh, this m movie that would, could break the studio in order to try to get the bank to sell um, this kind of has a it's a it's a screwball comedy for first and foremost. Um, there's a lot of really funny gags. There's some romance, and then at the end it kind of kind of becomes like a heartfelt, moralistic, uh, pro union movie. Like uh, kind of looking at class disparities. It's kind of woven into the feature throughout, but the class disparities really come like uh, up to the front as the movie reaches its end. And it's uh, kind of similar to like a Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, which is a movie I'll reference in a little bit. Um, kind of like that Frank Capra type of uh, feel good everyman type quality. But it, it doesn't lean too heavily like on that. It's not like saccharine. So uh, I really appreciate it for the appreciate it for that. Um, mostly I just really enjoyed the screwball comedy and the dynamic between the two leads and the movie it ends on like a really good note um, I enjoyed myself throughout it's only 90 minutes so like I didn't think it overstayed its welcome uh, I it's just a really enjoyable movie to me if you like Hollywood satires and kind of this is like an early look at Hollywood calling out itself which I think was really uh, successful. And my next film is the 1938 comedy, Merrily We Live, um, which is a really uh, funny movie. It, the most famous name in here, I would say for me, would be Billy Burke, um, who most know probably from The Wizard of Oz. Um, but I really enjoyed this movie. It has a pretty good uh, ensemble. I really liked Ann Dvorak, who I, uh, also saw in the classic flicks film Out of the Blue. Um, this concerns a lady, uh, a wealthy family, uh, one of whom is played by uh, Billy Burke, um, who is a woman who kind of collects uh, people who are down on their luck and tries to rehabilitate them and uh, build a better life for them. Um, and that has uh, consistently been kind of an issue within the family because as we are starting this, uh, at starting the film, the, her most recent project, uh, the person has stolen their silver and gone off. Um, and uh, she's like, no more, I will not do this anymore. And then like five minutes later, this guy uh, who is coming to visit uh, the area, um, he, his car breaks down, goes off of a mountain, and then he gets mistaken for a uh, someone who's down on their luck and gets hired as the butler. So it's kind of like a case of mistaken identity. Um, it, it leads to some really funny places um, that her daughters um, have like a really wide uh, a range of personalities. There's kind of like the more put together personality and then there it goes to kind of to some more extremes. There's a one of my favorite daughters is one who has two huge Great Danes who get into some nonsense. Uh, if you like to see Great Danes and Hats, this is a movie for you. Um, I uh, Overall, I, th I think it's a really strong screwball comedy. The transfer is really strong. Uh, this is probably one of the strongest transfers from uh, the movies I'm showing you today. Um, so yeah, if you like kind of like the screwball class dynamics and mistaken identity type stuff, uh, I would have, uh, highly recommend Merrily We Live. And then we have uh, a movie from 1952 called The Man Who Watched Trains Go By. Um, this stars Claude Rains, who most probably know best from The Invisible Man or Casablanca. Um, uh, he's starred in like, kind of a lot of lesser known work. And in terms of what I've seen, this is probably one of my favorites. He plays kind of like a buttoned up a uh, bookkeeper for a firm who, whenever some, uh, a uh, auditor kind of comes to town to look at the books because they think there might be something fishy, he learns that his boss has been the one kind of stealing from the firm and he was going to abscond with the money and meet up with his lover in Paris. Um, through a 
a series of events. Uh, Claude, the Claude Rains character, he leaves his family behind with the money that his boss was going to steal and goes to Paris to meet the woman he was going to meet. And it becomes like a really interesting dynamic of like, there's a, a, a dynamic between them of, of trying to ingratiate with one another. Uh, he kind of uh, wants to be with her and he, she wants the money that she thought she was going to get. And she's working with a partner who is trying to also get that money. Um, and then there's also the detect or the auditor from the original investigation who is trying to uh, protect the Claude Rains character because he thinks he's a man, a good man who's gotten over his head. Um, it's a really strong mystery um, and kind of moralistic tale of a man kind of who's been kind of confined by society and has finally decided to like break free. He's always been the one who's watched trains go by and like dreamt of adventure and now he's finally on an adventure and how will it end up? Um, it goes to some really interesting places. It's a really strong movie. It's only 80 minutes, so it kind of flies by. Um, it keeps your, in, uh, your interest throughout. Um, and yeah, it's another pretty strong transfer. The sound's pretty good. There's some like light age wear to it, like some hissing and stuff. But overall, I really enjoy this movie. It's one of my favorites. But what might be my actual favorite, it's kind of tough to say, is this 1945 Western Along Came Jones um, with Gary Cooper and Loretta Young. Um, most probably know Gary Cooper from High Noon or maybe Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, which I referenced earlier. Or uh, I came to this probably because I have a growing infatuation with Loretta Young. Um, I recently talked about China in one of the larger Video Attic episodes that we do. And then I also really enjoyed Rachel and the Stranger from Warner Archive a couple years ago. Um, I find her really charming. Um, this is another case of mistaken identity um, where a uh, stranger played by Gary Cooper comes into town and has the same initials as this uh, outlaw who is being hunted. And he, uh, Loretta Young tries to save him uh, from the mob that is coming, uh, trying to come after him for the reward but she also happens to be in league with the actual criminal, but it kind of becomes like a, a tale of like uncertain romance between she's thought she loved this original outlaw, but then this kind of doofus played by Gary Cooper, he comes into his own and kind of uh, goes from kind of like, like I said, a doofus to more of like someone who can really like, stand his ground and stand up to this outlaw. So it's a really interesting movie. I really liked it. If you like Westerns, this is one of the better ones I've seen recently. Um, it, uh, it's just, it's just a really strong narrative. Uh, once again, this is only 90 minutes and it goes by really quickly. I never looked at my watch once. Um, this is a case where it starts uh, Classic Flick starts this disc uh, talking about how they wanted to release this a couple, year early, couple of years earlier than they wanted, but the, re the elements were in such bad shape they couldn't do it until they found some better elements, which while still not perfect, um, they look really good. Um, there's a restoration comparison on here that you can see that shows like how, gr how great of an improvement this was from the original elements. Um, so yeah, if you are a fan of Westerns or Gary Cooper or Loretta Young, um, it's a really, really great Western. Um, so that is all I have for you today. Um, I would highly encourage you to support all Classic Flicks releases. Um, definitely check out these. I hope to have some more videos uh, displaying some of their work in the future. If you like this video, uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, give it, leave me a comment. Tell me what you thought about this. Um, tell your friends. Um, there will be full reviews for all of these, all of these discs on geekvibesnation.com in the coming weeks. Um, thank you for watching. My, once again, my name is Dylan Gonzalez and thank you for staying tuned to Geek Vibes Nation.